Hi, everybody, we're live. We're here in Adel. We got the train going by. My name is Elizabeth Mathern. I am with Cook Baxter Immigration in our South Georgia office, which is located in Adel, Georgia, halfway between Tipton and Valdosta, right off I-75. We are um, conveniently located to North Florida and um, immigration detention centers, which are located in South Georgia. We are about 30 minutes, 45 minutes from Irwin County Detention Center. I am happy to report that all, all reports indicate there are no longer any immigration detainees detained at that facility. So this is a, a big victory. And the one year anniversary of the big complaint that was filed by Project South against the facility detailing some pretty significant um, abuse was this week. So one year ago, that report came out and now there's no longer any immigration detainees at that facility. So um, we are celebrating that this week. That's a big celebration. I wanna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna give you some just generic um, immigration updates. Not a ton um, that's super exciting necessarily. A lot of things in the works that we're waiting to find out about. But I also wanna talk about something that I've talked about before I just want to go into a little bit more detail and, and remind people about how significant, how important it is that if you're accused of a crime and you are not a U.S. citizen, so regardless of if you have permanent residency, um, you have a grant of asylum, you were you were um, you entered as a refugee, you have a work permit because you have a pending application. If you are not a U.S. citizen and you are accused of a crime, I want to talk today about how significant, important it is that you have an immigration and criminal defense team that works together. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples that I've seen just this week. One person had a team that was working together. The other person didn't. And we'll just compare and contrast those two things. I'll give you a little bit of, um, you know, empowerment and encouragement to speak up for yourself, speak up for your rights, um, and that kind of thing. So I want to talk about that. As many of you may know, I started my legal career in criminal defense and then went to immigration law. Um, so I, I love both areas of practice. And my favorite part is where they intersect, right? Where immigration law and criminal defense intersect. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. I just also want to update you guys on um, vaccines are going to be required for people applying for residency. We're going to go into that in a little bit more detail. What does the immigration um, package, reform package look like? Mr. Cook went into a deep dive yesterday on this essential workers category that may be included. Um, it It's potentially um, can help a lot, a lot of people. Very excited about seeing um, what can happen with that. And um, I, so I'm not going to go into a ton of deep detail. You can check out Mr. Cook's Facebook Live yesterday um, to see if, you know, if, if you're interested in that deep dive. But I tell you, I read the um, one of the fact sheets and it's really exciting. We are also going to um, we're still waiting to hear from the parliamentarian as far as I know. Um, and. That's about it. So let's go. And then, of course, you know, um, we're still looking to see which embassies are currently serving people, which ones are closing, things like that. So um, anyway, let's jump right in. Please feel free to post your questions. Let's see. Uh, just as I say that, John posts a question. All right. Feel free to keep your questions coming. Let's answer those questions. Um, and as I'm waiting for questions to come in, I will. Um, 
talk, talk about some of these topics that I told you I would I wanted to cover today. All right, if you have a business, but you're not a US citizen, can you apply for a green card through your business? Okay, so um, the short answer is yes. Having a business can help you get residency in the United States, but um, most, if not all, employment-based or business-based visas are not available if you have a certain period of unlawful presence. That's time in the United States without permission. So John, the best thing, if, if you want to see if you or someone you know is eligible for residency based on um, a business idea or a business they have, the best thing to do would be to talk in a consultation about the specific situation. So um, for example, um, if a person has been here in a non-immigrant status or um, or has come and gone but never overstayed or has ended up with some unlawful presence through no fault of their own and it's a short period of time, maybe because of COVID, then um, a business visa might be might be a solution. So that would definitely be something to explore in a consultation. Um, but I will say employment visas, that is one of one of the things that prevents many people from being able to utilize them is the unlawful presence factor. So, all right. Whereas like with a family based petition for people who don't know, if you enter with a visa and overstay, marry, overstay and accumulate unlawful presence. Um, if you marry a US citizen or you have some other immediate relative petition, you're able to waive that unlawful presence um, either through a waiver or through um, it being forgiven through that immediate relative adjustment of status. So anyway, okay, so let's, let's touch base real quick on um, the vaccine requirement. So many people may know that, or you might've gotten an alert or seen it on the news that um, per, people applying for permanent residency after October 1st are gonna be required to show that they have the vaccine in their medical exam, which means that I think a new form will be coming out. Um, so if you, if you for some reason um, are applying for permanent residency and you are gonna do that after October 1st, you should be working now to be getting those, uh, those shots done. Cause I think it's mostly double, the two shots are available, but all right, folks, um, let's see. I see a few more questions coming in. Keep them coming. Let's see what we can do um, to answer those for you. Um, as you all know, we heard a few weeks ago that the Department of State was gonna prioritize certain types of visas. Um, I think that that is happening and it also seems to be happening depending on the consulate, the different consulate. Um, location. So that's interesting. Okay. I'm going to have to, it's going to be reflecting, but I'm going to have to put on my glasses to read all these questions. So thank you so much for everybody who's joined us and is jumping on with questions. I appreciate it so much. It's nice to be with you. If you're just joining, my name is Elizabeth Mathern. I am with Cook Baxter Immigration. Um, I am in the South Georgia office and I practice exclusively immigration law. All right. So if CBP stamps advised on residency requirements in passport after only four months away from the u.s what is the way forward i applied for a 131 to stay away for two years but only got notice of receipt and nothing more i'm due to depart the usa even though i don't have an approved i-131 okay this is a great question um you I would like to know just a little bit more about who, what you're going away for. If you, if you know you have that, um, is, if it's like a, um, a finite work contract or something like that, then um, I think you're, you're looking to be in good shape. So you're going you're gonna to go ahead and go with your receipt that you filed your 131, which uh, presumably you put in that the proof of why you're going out and why you need to stay out. But I wouldn't just rely on that 131 since like you said, it isn't just, it isn't yet approved. Remember that you can 
come in and out of the United States. You can travel if, if possible based on your situation. You can also maintain uh, residency ties. So you'll still need to make sure that you're paying taxes in the US. Maintain your, your house if possible. Maintain your driver's license. Hopefully that's not expired and that'll still be um, available. Hopefully you have um, some sort of arrangement for your mail, um, things like that. You want to maintain all the ties that you can. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm thinking ahead. Um, if you stay outside of the United States for a certain period of time as a lawful permanent resident, then the government can say that you abandon it, right? But you can argue that you did not abandon it and show proof that you uh, maintained residency and your intent was to always return, but for this situation. Filing of the I-131 is great proof of your intent to return and maintain your status as a permanent resident. Other things like paying taxes, um, voting, you, sorry, you can't vote as a permanent resident. Um, maintaining your taxes, doing other things that you can do um, to show that you're still actively involved in living and residing in the United States. And remember, there is um, foreign earned income tax credit. So you might um, up to a pretty high amount. I think it's 125,000 or something like that. So um, it's always advisable for people who are working abroad, going on a foreign assignment for a period of time, continue doing all of those things that help you maintain residency. If you are able to travel back to the United States within, you know, that six month window, um, do that just as more proof that you're intending to maintain residency. Um, and then also, I would encourage you to make sure that you follow up on that 131. You can submit inquiries and stuff like that to see if, um, you know, any actions being taken on it. So good job for um, being proactive and getting that in the works. Let us know how we can help. All right, let's see, guys. Thank you for the questions. Um, okay, Isaiah says, my mother just became a permanent resident and I have DACA divorced over 18. Could I benefit from her at all? Isaiah, I think I would need to know how you... I don't understand the divorce over 18. That must be you are divorced and you are over 18. I'm curious to know if you had DACA prior to turning 18 um, and whether or not you've ever traveled on advanced parole. Um, in theory, if you if someone gets DACA before they're 18, they don't accumulate unlawful presence um, for the purposes of inadmissibility. So in theory, um, if the visa category is current, your mom could petition for you as a permanent resident. Um, you could travel out, consular process, and come back in. Um, otherwise, if you, you know, there's not really much else. When she becomes a citizen, you'll be you'll be an adult. It's still not an immediate relative category. I think it, this all hinges on how you entered, whether you've done advanced parole, and whether you've accumulated unlawful presence. So, let's. Um, potentially that you should make a consultation and let's see if there's anything we can do with that. We'd need more information. All right, let's see, Gabby. Gabby wants to adjust her status through marriage, um, but I don't have a legal entry. I want you to do advanced parole and then go through the adjustment process. Okay, Gabby, you're on the right track. That's exactly what I would recommend that you do um, if you have DACA. So, Advanced parole is something that's available for people. It's available for DACA holders. If you don't have DACA already, initial DACA applications are frozen. So that's not going to help you in the immediate. Um, you might be a little bit stalled, but hang on. Um, if you're not able to do a DACA advanced parole, you may just have to wait. Um, and let's see what happens with the advanced parole. The other option, and it's always available, is waivers, right? So if you if you don't, the only inadmissibility that you have, the only bar that you have is that you entered without inspection and then you overstayed. 
If that's the only reason why you would have uh, trouble adjusting here, you can do a I-601A waiver. That's an unlawful presence waiver. It's called the stateside provisional waiver. So that's a waiver that can be approved here in the United States. It's like a pre-approval. Oh, Gabby, you said you do have DACA. Okay, good. So you can do an, uh, you can still do a DACA advanced parole. I'll just finish saying what I was saying for other people who might find it helpful. If you uh, do a 601A waiver, you get a pre-approval, you go out, do your processing, come back in. Um, the problem with the 601A waiver that's limited to hardship by your parent or your spouse who has to be a lawful permanent resident or U.S. citizen doesn't take into account hardship of children. Okay, so Gabby, returning to your question, I would definitely say do a DACA advanced parole. We can help you with that, um, or you can try to do it on your own. Those are still moving forward. You need a humanitarian basis, like to see a, grand, a sick grandparent, um, educational or professional. So um, either like a study abroad or some sort of a class um, or a foreign assignment, like your job sending you out to do a training or something, a training or a conference. Okay. Um, bah, bah, bah. Scroll up. So I hope that helps. Um, just keep in mind that my answer is general. And if you did have any anything else going on, um, like criminal history or anything like that, we would want to we would want to talk in more detail to figure out what exactly would be the best approach for you. OK, Ernesto says, how do I check my U visa case? It's from 2017. OK, Ernesto, you may you may already have tried the USCIS online case status update. Um, it's not very helpful for VAWAs or U visas. Um, you can do a written request. Um, you can call and ask to do a, an inquiry through the 800 number. If you filed it on your own um, and your attorney can't help you with that, then um, you, I would call the 800 number and I would ask them if you could um, submit an inquiry just to see what's going on with it. To be honest, your U visa is not that old um, in the picture of U visas. So um, it may still be just hanging out. Um, I'm wondering if you already got you, you should have like your, your receipts and everything like that. So um, try to call the 800 number unless you have some, some specific um, question that you want to ask about the U visa process. All right. So I have a DACA since 2012. I applied for advanced parole. My parents are permanent residents and my siblings are citizens. Um, is there a way for me to become legal? Damaris, this is an excellent question. So when we talk about um, doing advanced parole and then an adjustment petition, we're thinking about that in the context of an immediate relative petition. So that is um, a adult child petitioning for a parent, a spouse petitioning for another spouse. Um, I think there's one more, but I can't remember it. Those are the two we use most. Um, so in your case, your parents are permanent residents. You are, I assume, an adult. You're over 21. Um, and that parent petitioning for a child, adult child is not an immediate relative category. A, parent, a permanent resident parent petitioning for an adult child is not an immediate relative category. So the way you have to utilize uh, that category is by going out to consular process. So you're going to need a waiver. So in theory, um, it could be done, but you're going to need to do a waiver. So we need to look at whether how much accumulation of unlawful presence you have, um, et cetera. OK, it's possible. Totally possible. Um, now, your siblings being being citizens is also not an immediate relative category. 
and doesn't help a ton because most of the time the waiting list for sibling petitions is a long time, like 20 years. Um, I think for Mexico, it's like 30. Philippines, it's a long time. So usually if we've got something else that's in a faster line, we're going to look at that first. Um, but it never hurts if you only have a sibling that's a citizen for them to petition, do an I-130 for you. At least you have that pending. And then you can see what's going to happen in the future with the laws and stuff. All right. Let's see. Maria has a question. Her daughter has DACA and recently received the visa U. Does she have to renew her DACA? Um, Maria... She doesn't have to. I'm wondering if you're saying she got the work permit or she got like a, the, the temporary work permit or if she got the I-94 and her U visa. Um, that, might, that might influence my advice. Generally, my advice is always going to be to keep your options open. Um, if she, if her U visa is still pending and she just has the work permit because it's pending so long, uh, no, keep the DACA, keep the DACA going. But if she's got the approved U visa with the I-94 and she has her card for, what is it, three or four years, she's now on a path to permanent residency, I would say that she could not renew the U visa because she's kind of, if she renews the, I mean, not renew the DACA, she's kind of in the same status with both, but the U visa has a path to permanent residency. So for people who don't know, after three years of having a uh, U visa status, as long as you haven't gotten, had any trouble um, with the law, you're able to apply for your permanent resident status, um, your green card, because the U visa gives you, um, it, it waives your, any sort of like criminal stuff, but also it waives if you entered without permission and gives you an entry. So um, you're able to apply for your green card, which at this point we're not able to do with DACA. But I hate to just throw out something out there saying, oh, don't renew something um, without having talked with someone in more detail about exactly what's going on. I don't ever want to give up, um, some sort of application or status, um, before, like until the, until you have to, because why not keep your app options open? You never know what's going to happen necessarily. Um, okay. Let's see. Donovan says he is going from L1B to green card. His I-140 and 485 have been filed concurrently. His priority date is concurrent. Am I at a disadvantage by not filing the, will this affect the timeline? What are the current timelines for processing in Texas? All right, Donovan, I don't know those, those timelines right off the top of my head, but I can point you in the right direction. You can go to the case processing um, uh, where they report the case processing times on the USCIS website. And um, you can take a look at that. I don't know if it puts you at any disadvantage other than things going more slowly. Premium processing, I think it's supposed to move things more quickly, but um, I don't know, Donovan, of those timelines right off the top of my head. All right, let's see. Okay, Gabby is following up to my question. That's right. I have... Brenda, I have DACA. I traveled on advanced parole. Do you recommend my sister petitioning me through I-130? My sister recently petitioned for my parents. She's also sponsoring them. And this is a great question, and it kind of goes back to what I talked about a few minutes ago about how a sibling petition is not an immediate relative petition. So where your sister is able to petition for her parents as a U.S. citizen, that is an immediate relative petition. So um, it's faster and you're able to do some other things. A sibling petition does not provide you the same amount of flexibility. And sibling petitions are not current. They do not just immediately become available for 
for um, applying for a residency, they most have a very long waiting list. So, I mean, your sister could do an I-130 for you. You would have it um, pending, for example, when 245i became the law, you had to have a pending I-130 that was filed, approvable upon filing, filed prior to a certain date, which was April 30th, 2001. You had that petition, even though you couldn't use it to adjust at that moment, because of that reform, you were able to utilize the fact that you had that pending petition to help you um, pay a fine waive things and, and adjust your status in the future. We don't have anything like that at this moment, but if your sister filed an I-130 for you and that then became available, you would already have your receipt and your place in line. But other than that, it doesn't really provide you any uh, immediate path to getting residency um, you would have to consular process. There's a long waiting list. So it's not it's not immediate. It's not very effective. It also, you know, is just something that's kind of going to sit out there for a while. But some people see the value in having that submitted just in case something changes in the law, just in case uh, additional waivers are provided for people to be able to utilize um, a sibling petition to adjust more quickly. Um, you know, maybe even there's going to be potential. I don't think it's part of this package. There is some sort of premium processing um, for family-based petitions that's that's been thrown out there in this particular package, but I don't know that it's geared towards sibling petitions at all. So the short answer is, Brenda, that is totally up to you, but I don't think it's necessarily going to solve anything quickly for you. Um, it's more advantageous for your siblings. I mean, for your parents. All right. So let's see. Any new info on the reconciliation? Carlos, thanks for asking. Um, we, where we are right now is the Democrats argued um, to the par par parliamentarian and um, they also edited the bill in committee and that was passed out of the, I think it's Ways and Means Committee. The immigration portion was passed out. We're waiting to hear from the parliamentarian. Once we hear from the parliamentarian, if it can stay in, if it passes the test for being budget related, then we're gonna see if there's gonna be a vote. Um, they're supposed to vote by the end of September. So at this point, we one bit of news we're seeing some democrats saying the that the amount is too high um pushing back on some of the, they're pushing back a lot on the uh medical stuff right now so maybe they'll scratch a few things out uh, to try to lower the amount of the package but i don't know that they would scratch immigration out of it because the case is so strong in public opinion and the financial argument is there you know um what is it every dollar that uh we pay to um towards immigration processes um, an immigrant adds ten dollars to the economy or it's something like that where it's it's a 10 to 1 um analysis that benefits the country at large um so i think i don't i don't see the immigration piece of this being the reason why it, it doesn't go through. So I'm optimistic, but we'll see. All right. I just, wow, this 30 minutes has gone really fast and we've got a bunch of questions. Let me see what I can get through quickly and um, then we'll wrap up. And I didn't even uh, talk to you guys about um, if you are accused of a crime. I'm going to do that really quick and then I'll go through and try to answer some questions. I just want to highlight this because I did see it this week um, and just the contrast and I, I want to make sure that people are aware. If you are not a U.S. citizen and you are accused of a crime, I'm talking about even the smallest, smallest thing. Um, shoot, like having the wrong tag on your car 
or something like that, right? You don't know what can be interpreted as an inadmissible or a problematic offense under immigration law. It is not straightforward. It, it's very complicated. And there are criminal defense attorneys out there. If you hire an attorney, I'm not talking about just um, public attorneys. I'm talking about private attorneys. You hire an attorney and they tell you like, you know, oh, I can't advise you on that. Or, oh, it's a misdemeanor. It'll be fine. Or, um, you know, if you don't take this deal, it'll be off the table. You need to hurry up and make a decision. If you're not a citizen and your attorney is talking things like that to you, it is uh, your responsibility and to your benefit to make sure that you're speaking with an immigration attorney and potentially finding a different criminal defense attorney. This week I saw one person who had a criminal defense attorney who made sure that they reached out to a competent immigration uh, law firm, which happened to be us, but doesn't have to be us, to find out the consequences of a plea. We drafted a letter that outlined the consequences of a plea to any of the charges, and they were not what I think most people would consider serious charges. They were very um, just kind of everyday things. We outlined very clearly that the charges were going to be really bad on the person's immigration status. The criminal defense attorney was able to take that, put it together with a package called a mitigation package, and get this person a wonderful opportunity to do pretrial diversion. That means if they complete all the requirements um, similar to probation, the charges against them will be dismissed and their status will not be in jeopardy. On the other hand, we had a, a person that I know who um, communicated with their criminal defense attorney who pressured them to take the deal, who did not reach out to immigration counsel, who um, told them it was no big deal. and it's resulted in a very bad situation that now the person's status is in jeopardy. So please, 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 if you are accused, and this is the thing, you can be accused of a crime that you did not commit. Any of us can. You know, there, but for the grace of God, there go I. Any of us could be accused of the, like, unspeakable things. That's why we have, that's why we have um, a justice system. But the most important part about that is that you, as a non-citizen, are finding um, counsel that meets your needs. And part of what I'm trying to um, convey is how important it is to do that analysis, that investigation, before you enter into the plea. And if you have an attorney who is unwilling um, or disinterested in that portion of your representation, it's imperative that you find other counsel or at least independently reach out to an immigration attorney to have the, um, the consequences of a potential conviction analyzed. Remember, if you have a ticket and you pay a fine, that's a guilty. You are now convicted. Does it? You don't have to go to jail to have immigration consequences. Okay, so... Jumping off of that soapbox, I just really wanted to share that with y'all because I saw the contrast so stark this week and I just wanted to share it um, from my heart, hoping that it helps someone today or someone who watches this um, in the future. Okay, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through these and see what I can answer really quick. I'm already over time, but um, okay, let's see, let's see. Anderson, Tracy, I'm hearing spouses of U.S. citizens could be included in the bill and be able to adjust. Parents brought me when I was eight. Mother took me back to Mexico in 2006 for a couple of months. I'm not sure if... Yeah. Um, what, you're, what you're interested in Tracy Anderson, Anderson Tracy, is um, figuring out whether the perm bar uh, is going to go away. And I don't think it is. 
and I don't think it is. But for anybody who has the, the perm bar situation, uh, people call it multiple entries. Um, now, your first entry was in 95, so you may not have triggered the perm bar because that, that was signed into law in 97. So you could you potentially could benefit. Um, I think what what may happen, may be good for you, is the DACA, it may be a DACA expansion, um, and that may help you. If you uh, could just get that and then apply for a permanent residency, but that's not relying on whether or not you're married to a U.S. citizen. So you've got some complicated facts there. Um, I'd recommend doing a consultation with, with an immigration attorney and um, just make sure that if you just a lot of people think double entries or multiple entries makes you ineligible to adjust. It's more complicated than that. And you really do need to look at the time that was accumulated when the entries happened, whether they were under IRA IRA, which is the law that was passed in 97. So make sure before you're just assuming that you're barred by the perm bar that um, you have somebody dig into it. All right. Um, ba -ba -ba. I think that we, Can my in-laws file a petition for my husband? We are married, and he does have a petition with my sister-in-law. Oh, boy. The, the family relationships in that is a little bit confusing, Angelica. Let me see. Can my in-laws petition for my husband? So would that be his parents? Your husband's? Can your husband's parents petition for him? He has a petition from his sister-in-law that's uh, 245i. So it's March, 2001, they're from Mexico. So I need to unpack this a little bit. Okay, so the parents are citizens. If, okay, there's a couple of things that we need to look at. One would be if your husband were married to a US citizen and he has a petition that was filed for him by his sister back in 2001, then he could adjust here based on the marriage. If the sibling petition is current, we gotta check the visa bulletin, which I haven't for a while, but so I don't know where Mexico siblings is. I could do it now, but we don't have a lot of time. If sibling petition was current, he could adjust on that with 245i. That's pay the fine, adjust here. So because he has 245i, he has some, some options. For his parents to petition for him, there's a waiting line. So I don't know, it's, we gotta look at the timing and he could use 245i for that. So as long as that um, petition from his sister was filed prior to April 30th, 2001, you've got proof of that. It was approvable upon filing, which they're, they're siblings. So it was, I'm sure. Um, then he has options. So I think meet with somebody, make sure you have proof of that previous petition. He's got options. He's got options. And I see that you said they became citizens. All right, Salas, um, Brianne, I applied for initial DACA. That's pause now. Working on my GED, having on daycare, self-employed, file taxes. How can I show proof as an essential worker? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna figure out once once the bill is like comes out and and these categories are defined, we're gonna have to figure out what exactly the categories are, right? I think you're asking like if I don't have or if someone doesn't have employment authorization, how do they show that they were actively employed in a certain category? in order to qualify for this um, essential worker under the immigration reform. So I would do that in a number of ways, um, but I would want to, you know, kind of see what you have, right? Like you are a home daycare potentially has invoices. They, uh, the parents pay them. Um, they, now you say you do every year, you do file taxes. So I think your taxes would be good. 
you might want to consider trying to um, figure out how you can get your business um, Sorry, I was distracted by another comment coming in. I'm trying to think of like how, how, what other ways would you prove your business? Now, in any state, childcare is pretty highly regulated. So, um, but it's usually uh, uh, over a certain amount of children for a certain amount of hours and things like that. I don't practice that area of law at all, but that'd be really important for us to look into. I would, you know, with anybody, I want you to be able to show documentation that um, meets the requirements, but I, I don't want you to put yourself in, expose yourself to some other liability. So that's why we have to, we have to think things through and look at things carefully um, as to what all you wanted to put out there. Um, you know, you might, I guess, it's gonna be really interesting to see what these categories are. Um, and they may have a certain requirement of how many hours a week you did this thing that is um, to require as an, to, to meet the requirements as an essential worker. So anyway, Brianne, let's keep an eye on how that unfolds and we can figure out documentation a little bit more um, once we see what the requirements are. If hopefully child care. I'm pretty sure childcare will be on there. Um, what you might want to do in the meantime is do some research on what you need to um, get licensed and um, all of that. Or if you keep a number of children that's under a certain amount, maybe you're not required to be licensed. And in that case, even better. Okay. All right. So let's see. I'm going to start wrapping up here, folks. Thank you so much for everybody who joined. Um, okay, so Angelica's just saying she's following up. Well, have a petition for you, Lisa, and DACA as well. So hopefully, absolutely. I think that um, keeping your options open and seeing what all ends up getting you where you want to go um, first, right? Cause you can have multiple petitions running at the same time, things like that. And, um, you will be eligible. Hopefully if this reform passes, people will be eligible to file for that, even if they have other things pending or other temporary statuses. All right. So my name is Elizabeth McThurn. I am uh, with Cook Bags for Immigration in the South Georgia office. I have enjoyed being with y'all today. Happy Thursday. Hope you have a great end of the week and a great weekend. Thank you so much for everybody who joined, jumped on with questions. It's been great. Um, I will be back next Thursday. We'll be on our countdown to see if this immigration reform is going to happen or not. Remember that you can follow us on Twitter. Um, like, subscribe, follow us on Facebook, YouTube. Should I think we even have a TikTok? I don't know how many videos are on there, but soon, you know, you might see, I don't know if you'll see me on there, but you'll see some of us on there. Um, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook for the latest immigration updates. If there is any late breaking news on the immigration reform, if you um, have subscribed or, you know, push the little button to get the alerts, you can be assured that we are going to jump on and let you know um, what's going on with this immigration reform. And if you've subscribed, you'll be alerted to us jumping on to tell you the latest, the most accurate um, analysis of what is happening in immigration law. So thank you so much for joining and I'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.